Hello and welcome to the Section 12J webinar it's brought to you by Westbrook Alternative Asset Management. I'm Bruce Whitfield and around the table with me, Dino Zaculo and Jonty Osher, they are with Westbrook Alternative Asset Management. Dino, let's see what you sound like. Good morning, Bruce. How are you? There we go. It could be evening because people can download this any time, you know, Dino. And Jonty, you sound like this. Good morning and good evening to the listeners. Okay, he's the, the, he's the more Barry White version, you understand <laughs> that. And then legal advisor and the head of tax at Worksman's Attorneys, Ernst, Ernest Mazansky is with us as well. Ernest, hello to you. Hi. And joining us is a new member of the Westbrook Alternative Asset Management Team, Kate Langlois. You're going to be head of business development, the face, the voice, the contact point for Westbrook into the future. That's it. Hi, everyone. Can't wait to meet you all. Well, that's uh, that's if everybody, of course, invests um, in <laughs> Section 12J. We did this in February. Um, we, we chatted all about the state of 12J, but lots of people may have missed the first of these webinars. Uh, Dino, just give me a broad sense, please. Westbrook, and then John Tim would ask you to talk about 12J. But Westbrook Asset Management, where do you fit into the world of investments? Sure. So Westbrook is an alternative asset management and private equity business that was founded in the early 2000s, initially as a private equity business, but more focused on what we call principal investments. The difference being that in traditional private equity, you normally bring in third party capital. In our business, initially, we were only investors of management and our shareholders cash. Uh, the private equity business today has grown to a north of 4 billion rand turnover business. And we're the company behind the likes of Corrycraft and Volpees and Dialabed. But in the early 2010s, we started to identify a number of opportunities that we thought were better suited to bringing in third-party capital as opposed to purely investing our own money. And that really is the genesis of Westbrook Alternative Asset Management, where today we work through four pillars that each offer a alternative asset management investment product to our investors. And I think importantly, Westbrook is significantly invested from an equity perspective in all of the products that we offer to our investors. Jonty, give me a sense, please, of Section 12J. It's still not part of the investment lexicon. A lot of independent financial advisors are aware that there is this thing. They may be cautious to recommend 12J to their clients because it is still relatively new in terms of adoption, although the laws have been around a long time. So Section 12J is actually a section in the Income Tax Act. And it's an incentive designed to stimulate um, small and medium-sized businesses across South Africa. And for an investor investing in a Section 12J company, they get a 100% tax deduction in the year that they invest. So essentially, it's a private-public partnership between the investor, government, and the asset manager to use private capital in a tax-efficient manner to stimulate the economy. The section of the Act was put in in 2009, but really only became attractive to investors in 2015, when they amended the act to say that the tax deduction isn't recouped if the shareholder holds their shares for five years. So if you hold your shares in a 12J company for five years, there's no full recoupment of the tax deduction you got up front. And I think since 2015, the 12J industry has been doubling every year. The last reported numbers we have from SARS and National Treasury is that the industry is about 3.7 billion. And we're quite proud we're about 1.7 billion of that industry, so about 50% of the market. A very significant player in the world of Section 12J. Ernest Mazansky, the head of tax at Worksman's Attorneys, a lot of people will look at things like retirement annuities as a way of paying less tax rather than as a great investment strategy. A lot of people looking at 12J will say, hold on a second, there's a tax break. I pay the marginal rate of 45%. I, can, you know, I get a, a huge upside in terms of the tax relief on this, surely that's not the only reason to be considering a 12J investment. Oh, I, I think the two are entirely different. One is motivated by entirely different considerations uh, going into retirement annuities or pension funds on the one hand and uh, 12J investments on the other. They're entirely, entirely different uh, uh, investments. Um, I think I think with the 12J investment, um, you know, the, the attractiveness is the tax break, obviously, um, because you immediately reduce your cost down to 55% of the 
of, of the funds you put in. But let's not forget, you still have 55% of your capital at risk. Um, because if the, if the investment goes pear-shaped, it's your money that's going down the tubes, not anybody else's. So you still need to be concerned about what that investment is going to do and that at least you're going to recoup your 55%. And, of course, no one goes into an investment uh, wanting just to get their money back. They want to get a, at least a reasonable return on, on their total investment. So, yeah. In the world of 12J, then, um, Dino, what is a reasonable investment? Because it, you said you talked about private equity, so people immediately attach a private equity return. Um, and you start going, well, I put my money in for five years. I expect at least to quadruple it because I'm taking risk. And then I get the tax break on it. I mean, I'm going to get rich. Um, it, should one moderate one's expectations? Bruce, I think it's a great question. And I think it comes down to the ultimate investment paradigms that are true of any investment which is that there's a direct correlation between risk and return. And I think for any potential investor coming into a 12J investment, it's really important to identify the fact that 12J, and we'll talk about it later in this podcast, 12J does give you an attractive return from a tax perspective, but at the end of the day, you've still got an underlying private equity style investment that you've made and that you as an investor need to get comfort around. Now, in the world of 12J, there's a spectrum. There's guys who are doing startup type businesses which are taking high risk on the basis that the worst that one can lose is 55% of their original investment. And those type of 12J investment strategies would typically target a higher return profile. That could be north of 30, 40, 50%. On the other end of the spectrum, and this is typically where Westbrook has preferred to play, there are sort of more or less aggressive investment strategies that one can follow in a 12J structure that target more conservative returns. And I think Westbrook has always been more on the asset back side of investments, targeting more around an investment return in the high teens, as well as paying an attractive semi-annual dividend to investors in certain strategies. When it's not then just about the tax break, John T. I mean, the tax break is an attractive incentive from a, the state's perspective to say, rather than give us the tax, you think you can apply this money better and you can get us the growth that we need to generate future tax revenues. That's great. Let's help grow this economy together. It then goes into very specific asset classes and it goes into very specific uh, regime of what can and cannot be invested in. What are the broad parameters of that? So I think how the, the act or the piece of legislation is written is that they say you can go into anything other than what they determine or define as impermissible trace. And broadly speaking, there are five kind of categories that you can't invest in in order for the investment to qualify as a qualifying investment for the 12J entity. And that those investments exclude you from trading in fixed property unless you trade as a hotel keeper, in financial services or insurance services. You can't invest in businesses that are professional services like law firms or accounting firms. You can't invest in businesses that trade in the sin industry, so tobacco, alcohol, gambling. And the business you do invest in has to trade in mainly in South Africa. So I think when in assessing an investment strategy as an investor, what you're looking to invest in, understand what the underlying investment mandate and strategy is, but from a governance and compliance perspective, the 12J shouldn't be investing in any of those impermissible traits. Who is regulating what is being invested in? Because a bit like the craft gin industry, which started out with two or three distilleries and now there are 150, the, the 12J industry has sort of grown exponentially along those sorts of lines as well. So again, how the legislation has been worded, there's a 36-month deployment. So of the capital you've raised, you've got to deploy... 80% within 36 months. And that's when we believe coming up in February, SARS will come audit what we've invested in and through that mechanism, understand our investments and see that they comply with the, the compliance requirements within 12J. I think maybe just to add to that, there are a variety of layers from a regulatory perspective that have been put in place in 12J to ensure that investors are protected. So your 12J company gets accredited by SARS before you can get a SARS license, you also need to have an FSB, at least a CAT1 license. Um, and then in addition, depending on the manager that you've invested with, typically your manager will try and put in place mechanisms to ensure that investors are protected. So for example, our Section 12Js are all public companies due to the number of investors that we take in. And as a result, we have a board of directors that are majority independent, non-executive. In addition, we've got an independent administrator who looks after the cash and mandate management, and we've got audits on an annual basis. 
Ernest Mazansky, how do I, as a financial advisor or I, as a private investor, know that what I am investing in, know for absolute certain, is in fact 12J? So that when I fill in my tax return, um, early February, middle of February, and I put in my 500,000 Rand, 5 million Rand contribution as a tax deductible item, I know that SARS is going to accept that as such, and I don't end up with a tax liability come audit time. Well, um, one of the requirements of Section 12J is that the venture capital company, um, what everyone calls the 12J company, but is really a venture capital company, is obliged to issue you with a certificate of investment, uh, which indicates the number, the sort of re your investor number, as well as the amount you invested. Um, and when one of the on the wizard, when you do your tax return, it says, did you invest in a, in a venture capital company? And if you tick yes, a box comes up which actually asks you for the number and the amount. And um, you can bet your bottom dollar that if you've invested in one of those, you'll, you'll be up for verification um, and you'll, they'll be ask you to submit a copy of it. Um, what stops me if I'm a dab hand with Microsoft Word of creating a fake certificate? I mean, not that uh, that would be highly amateurish, but my point is there will be shysters and charlatans and chancers who claim to be registered as 12J providers who might not be. I have no idea what checks and balances they have, but I'm sure that, that they can check back with the, the, the venture capital company number back, and I'm, I think they have to report to SARS um, uh, every quarter, whatever it is, and SARS, I imagine, have a method, methodology of matching numbers. It's exactly the mechanism. So on a semi-annual basis, what we have to do is the 12J manager is submit a report of all of our investors, the quantums of their investment and their details, and then effectively the SARS process is to match the certificate to the reporting that we've given, and when they match then typically the 12-J deductions are Bruce. Sorry, and Bruce, I just want to add one thing This there. is Jonty, by the way, just in case you wonder, because everyone's getting very excited about participating. Jonty. I, I think from a perspective prior to investment, if you're an investor that want to assess if the 12-J or venture capital company is actually licensed, you can go on the SARS website, and they've got the list of all the approved venture capital companies, and you can also ask the asset manager for the actual license issued by SARS with the venture capital number on there. So that's prior to investment to, to ensure that you are actually investing in a 12 jet company. You know, it's a similar thing in regard to when you make uh, donations to uh, charities and your 18A deductions. Also, you have to put in the number. And yeah. and similarly, it's the same thing with PAYE, where they match the RP5s, which they've been given by the employee employers. They'll match. In fact, they pre-populate your tax return with, with, with your PAYE. Or, or the banks send in their, uh, uh, their the interest that they've, they've paid you. It's a, it's a similar matching process that they use. How does one identify between a decent Section 12J and one that is not going to deliver a decent return? One can, when one looks at unit trusts, for example, look at a 10-year history. Um, when one can look at 10-year returns, five-year returns, three-month, one-day returns on a multiple multitude of websites. So how does one look at... 12J track records, one look at the credentials of the individuals running the funds and have any kind of assurance that you're not going to be Marcus Eusted. Bruce, I think it's a difficult one in the, in the basis that, as John T. explained earlier, 12J hasn't been around all that long. I mean, it's been in the law since 2009, but only really took off in South Africa in 2015. So it's an important question for any investor who wants to potentially invest in 12J to consider a few things. I think there's a variety of risks that come in, in, in inherently in any 12J investment, and one of the most important is your manager risk. So some of the mechanisms that an investor can potentially put in place to ensure that they're protected include, number one, taking a look at that manager's track record of performance, and preferably that manager wouldn't just be a 12J manager. Typically what you'll find, and, and we're very proud of it at Westbrook, is that we were in asset management and private equity long before we were invested into 12J. Um, and as a result, Westbrook also has a larger reputation and brand to uphold than purely option value on some 12J investments that will hopefully be successful. So I think really important is to do a due diligence on the manager. Secondly, quite importantly, is to ask the manager for their historical investment returns and their performance to date in 12J. That's difficult because very few 12J companies have gone through a full five-year cycle and have actually exited yet. 
But having said that, again, if you go back to the credentials and performance of the manager and the knowledge of the team, you can get a long way to protecting yourself. But, John T., the risk profile has changed. I mean, if you are historically a venture capital investor with a, a much higher than market risk and much higher, therefore, successful return, now you're going for a more conservative profile because, 12, you want to be a bit more cautious and people are and there's a tax incentive in place and for all of the reasons that we've discussed already, your risk profile changes. So how do I know that you're as good at managing 12J as your history might show you were as venture capitalists? So, so I think it's quite important, first of all, to understand the investment mandate of the strategy you're investing in because that will dictate what the manager can and can't do from an underlying investment perspective. So I think if you understand what the manager is investing in and you combine that with their track record in previous asset management or private equity product, as well as the track record to date of what they've done in 12J, I think you can quite quickly see the, the ability and the expertise of, of the manager to execute on that strategy. And I think maybe one thing to add to Bruce's point is that, and just to clarify, 12J is called the venture capital company regime. But it's an interesting thing that nothing in 12J actually requires you to invest in a startup venture capital business. What 12J was designed to do is to promote private investment into small and medium-sized enterprises in the South African economy. So importantly, from the perspective of Westbrook and our investment strategies, we're not focused on venture capital per se in the sense of finding people with good ideas that are starting businesses from scratch. Our mandate and our philosophy has always been one of focusing on providing growth capital to small businesses in South Africa where we think there's great operators that to the extent that they've got a good solid equity backer can become very successful large businesses in time. And that's really where we've focused. Ernest, do you want to add? Yeah, I think there was just something else just on, on your point, and that's this. The typical investor into into a venture capital company, 12J, is not someone who's going to put in um, a thousand rand a month as they would, uh, you know, 10,000 rand as they would into unit trusts. Um, you know, th these people are putting in minimum investments of 500,000 or a million or whatever it what, is. What is your minimum at Westbrook? So our minimum is typically 500,000 rand yeah. per investor. Okay, so we're talking about high income earners and the sophisticated end of the market. So I think one can, you know, assume that these people are understand the, the issues of risk and, you know, they're not, they're sophisticated people. And, and um, you know. Assumption. Oh, the road to hell is paved yeah, with yeah. assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was good intentions. Um, we, Kate Langlois would like to now, mm. three weeks into the job, um, <laughs> would, would like to dip in, which is good. No, if I can add to that. So I think um, a part of the market that we are looking to um, offer this to are the financial advisor market. And there we'd look to partner with financial advisors who have the background to ascertain the risk of the 12J fund that the, the investor is looking to um, put their money into and to advise their client on whether or not this risk profile is right for the client's overall portfolio. Because really, we, we are an alternative asset manager, and we're looking at that alternative space. So this typically wouldn't form the full part of a client's portfolio, just to add. No, and that's an important point to make. But already, we've got, Kate, um, we've, already got, uh, we've already got financial advisors. You've got tied advisors, of course, who sell only specific products, the company products. And then you've got the independent financial advisors. And that's the market that you're going to be targeting. But even they can't sell a suite of more than three or four companies' products. Now we add adding another layer of, I don't know, how many, how many, um, how many Section 12J companies are there? I think there must be over 60 by now. Then uh, the potentially a universe of another 60 um, potential investment strategies into this mix. It just makes the life of the financial advisor a lot more complicated too. Well, w welcome, Kate. So I think, <laughs> I think a big part of my job is to come in and to uh, equip advisors with the tools to be able to firstly understand it, assist them with the DD process on our 12 days, and then to be able to go and ascertain whether this is a risk profile that they want for their client. Um, unfortunately, it is a big job for them. It is. To try and understand those 70 plus um, funds is going to be a, a big job for the market. I also think that, that I think in practice, it's not 70 plus funds because the vast majority of those of a very targeted investment, and some of them are really closed funds mm. in the sense that they have a very targeted investment uh, base and they're actually not looking for public money, whereas Westbrook is looking for public money and uh, there are not too many Westbrooks out there. 
And I think just to add to that, we've kind of been on roadshow now raising capital kind of every January and February each year. And we've chatted to a lot of wealth managers, IFAs and investors and gained a lot of knowledge on what they're looking to kind of get and understand from a 12J. And we are in the process of launching what we call an investor toolbox or an IFA toolbox on our website, which will provide the IFA or wealth manager with a lot of those tools to help understand what 12J is, to understand our investment strategies, and to kind of package that and kind of get upskill themselves with regards to 12J. Dino? So maybe it's worthwhile, Bruce, for the benefit of wealth managers and independent financial advisors who are listening, is to unpack the 12J universe a little bit. So there are more than 130 registered Section 12J venture capital companies at the moment. As Kate alluded to, there are managers who have more than one. So when you start to whittle that down, there's probably in the region of 50 to 60 different people managing 12J companies. When you then take out those who are doing more private structures, as Ernest alluded to, you're probably left with 20 to 30. Then what you've got to start to do is, you know, you've got different investment buckets as a financial advisor that you're trying to allocate to. Some people are looking for higher risk and smaller investment sizes. Others are looking for lower risk and larger buckets. And when you start to then further segment the 12J market into the smaller categories in terms of what the risk profile is, what the return targets are, et cetera, you'll actually see that there's probably not less than 10 uh, or, or, you know, in each, or maybe, sorry to rephrase, not more than 10 in each that are actually viable opportunities for your clients. And I'm sure we'll talk about it later in this discussion around where, where Westbrook fits into that spectrum from a returns perspective in terms of how our underlying investment returns actually work. I was about to go there. You've got three investment strategies. You talk about Westbrook Aria, Westbrook Stack, and Westbrook Hospitality. Should we start alphabetically? Let's go with Aria, John T. So, so Westbrook Aria as a strategy is really a strategy that looks to take the investor capital that's in the 12J and use it to provide growth capital to businesses where there's a movable asset underpin that can go out and operating rental. And in English, that might be what? A delivery so, so, truck. So let's use an example, which we believe is, is kind of one of our great success stories. It's a company called Mobile Max. Mobile Max is a company that identified a gap in the scooter delivery market where franchisees were buying their own scooters, not really maintaining them. Kind of to have one or two scooters was quite difficult to maintain. So what they did is they, they created a business that through kind of scaling up could get a good workshop, keep parts, and service these these franchisees. But as part of that, they offered a rental option. And through all of this, famous brands identified them as as a key supplier to their franchisees. And this kind of gave a great capital requirement to Mobile Max in that they now had a high demand for these bikes. And the shareholders didn't have all the capital to help this business grow. So Westbrook Aria, as a 12J fund, entered in as a capital growth capital provider and essentially owns a fleet of scooters that are on rental to famous brand franchisees. And in part, that has grown uh, Mobile Max's employment by 55%. The EBITDA has almost doubled. Um, they're now, when we joined them, there were about 700 scooters on the road. They're now over 1,500. Um, we believe we've created over 400 jobs for drivers. So, so through using that capital, we're we kind of meeting size requirements, but also helping businesses grow. More scooters on the road. I don't think anybody will thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> but Unless you're waiting for a pizza. <laughs> Unless you're waiting for your pizza and you want a hot pizza, it's not a good thing. <laughs> Dina? Look, I think the one person who might thank us for that is National Treasury. Um, we've been fortunate enough this year to spend a bit of time engaging with them through some of the changes that they've made to Section 12J. And one theme which has become very clear through that process is that job creation is a important strategic imperative to government. But it's also a requirement of Section 12J of funds. The investments you make must go into businesses that do create jobs. Well, it says that it must go into certain types of businesses of certain sizes. It doesn't say jobs. And that's quite interesting. And it's something that we've been spending time trying to understand and unpack with Treasury in terms of what exactly does Treasury view as being the ultimate success metrics for Section 12J, because they could be varied. Uh, and it seems that job creation is quite important. And, and a business like Mobile Max is something that we're really proud of, given the level of jobs that it sustains. Um, and so that's Westbrook Aria. We are, you are, listening to a podcast with Westbrook uh, Section 12J 
Participants, it's a webinar. It's designed to help you better understand the 12J environment, which has been around since 2009. Nobody really paid much attention to it until about two or three years ago when there were some legislative changes. Uh, subsequently, there's been a huge amount of noise around 12J and there's been some change in regulation. And we'll touch briefly on some of the less boring, less technical parts of it, the bits that really matter to you in a moment. But Westbrook Aria and then Westbrook Stack, S-T-A-C, Dina. So Westbrook Stack stands for Student Accommodation. And you'll see each of our funds typically has a little four-letter acronym. Um, and really what Stack is, is a fund where we've identified student accommodation as a space in the South African economy that we found really attractive as a 12J investor, um, but also as an industry in the South African markets. If you look at places like North America and the UK, you'll see that student accommodation is an established property class, much in the same way that retail, commercial, industrial, retirement living, etc. is. In South Africa, student accommodation is still in its infancy, but is growing quickly. Um, and what we really like about student accommodation is the fact that as an investor, there's a significantly higher demand for beds in student accommodation around the country than what there is supply. And to the investor, what that translates to is an asset which is full typically throughout the year, which generates an attractive yield and also which has an, an underpin of capital growth on exit. I think that's the investor case. But also to the South African economy, it really is a, a case of meeting the requirements of 12J in so far as where we currently sit as South Africans is that we don't have enough beds for people to get educated. So I'm going to throw three things at you. Fees must fall, fee-free education, a funding crisis um, through the government's mechanism to fund education, which not only must fund education, but also has got to help young people with absolutely nothing to be able to fund a student accommodation. That mechanism isn't working particularly well at the moment, which must add a layer of risk then to this particular part of Torte. I don't disagree, and I think this is a classic example of explaining to the investor that any investment that you make bears with it risk. As a response to your question, I think fees must fall may initially seem as an, a negative to an investor, but if you unpack it, in my view, is actually a positive. Because what we did see from the fees must fall movement is that students in South Africa for the first time in a while have a voice and that governments have taken that voice very seriously and have shown education to be a, a really important strategic underpin for the country. And for so long as students are empowered and for so long as government remains committed to education of students in South Africa, we see it as a very low commercial risk that government would ever pull funding for students in this country. I, I like the fact that your funds have got four-letter acronyms like Westbrook Hospitality. That's like a four-syllable um, acronym. Um, but yes, Westbrook Hospitality. And again, many 12J funds do go into the hospitality sector because they do tick the employment box not quite nicely. So the hospitality sector is quite an interesting one, and we've been involved in it since 2016 where we raised our first fund. We essentially have two investment strategies in the hospitality space that this year we're looking to combine. One of the strategies is a partnership with the Capital Hotel Group. The Capital Hotel Group is the fastest growing South African hotel keeper in the country. They're throwing up properties all over the place, yeah. And and, and that is actually a function of, of 12J Capital, which we have raised. So in that strategy, we have raised $450 million, which we're investing in the Capital Hotels. And since we've been involved with the Capital Hotel Group, we've probably opened about four hotels. Um, there's been about 2,000 indirect and direct staff through construction jobs or whatever employed over that period. So, so that's the kind of the layer from the South African economy perspective. But from the investor perspective, you really are investing in hotel assets across South Africa that attract a, a great yield and have a good underpin from an, from an asset value perspective. The other strategy that we, we have in our general hospitality fund is a strategy, uh, Westbrook Alto, which invests in property in Cape Town, which then trades as a hotel keeper through the online platforms such as Airbnb, Booking.com, TripAdvisor, really there in partnership with a partner called Quorum Leisure to grow a decentralized hotel offering for tourists entering the Cape Town market. Now, Ernest Mazansky, skipping all of the boring bits, because the law has got lots of those. They're all important, but some of them are boring. There have been some big changes to the legislation and the regulation around 12J over the last six months or so. As a financial advisor, as a private investor keen on 12J, what do I need to know? Well, um, the changes that came about were as a result of Treasury 
perceiving that there was some abuse going on in the industry. And um, um, in fairly typical Treasury style, they came out with a, a shotgun approach without having done their homework properly. And um, they, they effectively brought the entire industry to a grinding halt uh, when they published their draft legislation. Um, and everyone put everything on hold. These are all technicalities that affected the industry rather than the individual investor. But obviously, as I said, everything went on hold. Uh, thankfully, these issues have now been sorted out, uh, apparently, to the satisfaction of most parties. Uh, and as far as the investors are concerned, it's now business as usual again. So I think nothing needs to concern them from that perspective going forward. What happens if I, as a financial advisor, put my client into a Section 12J fund that SARS later deems to have not qualified? Who carries the liability there? Um, well, the liability, well, the cost of the liability will ultimately be borne by the investors in the, in the venture capital company, but not directly. It'll be indirectly. What happens is that if the venture capital company does not conform because it breaks the rules, SARS comes back to them effectively and gives them, uh, points out the problem and gives them a period to rectify. And if they do not rectify or they're incapable of rectifying within the prescribed period, SARS withdraws the approval and as a result, they raise an assessment on the venture capital company equal to is it 1.25% of the total deductions claimed by the investors. So the venture capital company itself gets taxed. But of course, indirectly, that's a cost to the to the shareholders. But you don't end up with the tax you problem don't invest, no. in that the SAR says you put 500,000 no. rand into illicit 12J. Therefore, no. we no longer allow that deduction. You're liable for the tax. And by the way, you're not penalized no. on the no. capital as well. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that is a big concern, I'm sure, you know, for many people. True. And I think one thing that I wanted to just point out to Ernest's discussion earlier is that there are certain things that the manager can do to protect the investor. And this is one area where Westbrook works very closely with Ernest and Worksman's is that before we launch a new Section 12J strategy, what we will do is we'll get a template transaction together that we're actually going to conclude in that strategy and we will take it to SARS and we'll request that they give us what's called an advanced tax ruling on that particular transaction. And what effectively the advanced ruling does is it says in respect of that transaction and the way you guys intend on concluding it, we as SARS are comfortable and we give you a binding ruling to the effect that this is compliant with the Section 12J's requirements. To then take it a step further and to bring it into the context of the recent amendments, what Treasury have shown is a willingness to only make changes with prospective effect. And I think that's really important for an investor is that what's been done has been done and SARS have shown that they will not retrospectively make changes. And as a result, the practical risk if your manager manages things correctly of an investor having a retrospective tax recoupment is very low. I, I, think, I think that's correct, uh, Dino, but I think what, um, what Bruce was asking was something slightly different because if, for example, the venture capital company did start selling liquor or did start renting out immovable property or dealing in arms and ammunition, um, that, that, the, no binding ruling is ever going to help no. you in that regard. Agreed. No. There's, there's two stages of this yeah. whole thing. There's the, there's the pre-investment and then there's the ongoing management. As with everything, there are 50 shades of grey. Um, and it's so not on the extreme sides of investing. You, 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 if you invest in a fund that claims to be 12J and that's doing arms dealing, you've only got yourself to blame. Um, Jonty, before we wrap up on the very important issue of costs, um, do you wanted to add something more to certainty. So, so I just wanted to give the Westbrook perspective on, on our engagement with Treasury. The, the main view that Treasury gave us with regards to how they see the 12 J's should be set up is that there should be a group of retail or passive investors investing in the top in the 12 J level into a portfolio of underlying investments. And I think from a Westbrook perspective, that has always been our strategy and, and going forward will remain our strategy. So 
the legislative changes did make a lot of noise in the industry, but thankfully for Westbrook, it doesn't really have an impact on our business model or targeted returns at the underlying investment strategies. Okay, costs, very important. In a world where stock market returns have been, especially in South Africa, um, have been negligible for the last three years, suddenly costs matter more than ever before, and everyone's obsessed about costs. Everybody's going into uh, into ETFs, and everyone's trying to save as much money on costs as possible because we've understood the long-term impact of paying high fee structures. Help me on this one, Dino. Bruce, we charge a 2 and 20, and the way we've tried to structure our fee model is very much back-ended. So where a lot of the industry has moved to charging an upfront fee for capital raising, Westbrook has the benefit of being an existing business that can sustain itself. We don't charge any upfront fees. There's then a 2% annual asset management fee, which allows us to continue operating the business and to do the deals. But really where we earn is if we perform. And the way that works is we charge a performance fee equal to 20% of any amount that we return the investor after they've gotten all their capital back. And the way we do that is we say, you invest 100 Rand, you get a 45 Rand if you're an individual tax refund. What we then need to do is take that 55 Rand and grow it above a hurdle. And that hurdle varies between the strategies. It's either CPI or or JIBAR. And once we've then returned that amount plus the hurdle to the investor at the end, we share in 20% of the upside. But I think practically what that means is that it's, it's twofold. Number one, unless we are able to successfully secure an exit for our investors, we don't get paid. And unless we perform, we also don't get paid. And I think just to add to that, the underlying nature of, of what we do in a Section 12J company is private equity investing. 12J requires you to invest in equity shares in the underlying um, investment or target investment that you're targeting. So you really are doing private equity due diligence, you are going through shareholders agreements, MRIs, commercial agreements. So there's a lot of deal work, which is kind of different to say a unit trust model. Um, So we we execute through our strategies on 10, 15, 20 deals a year. And that's really why we followed a 2 and 20 private equity style fee model. Okay, very briefly then, the process of investing? Hi, that, um, that would be me. Okay, um, Kate, Kate's back. <laughs> yeah, so please um, go to our website. You'll have um, a brief summary of all of the funds. Um, you'll have the contact us um, button where my name will be and my email address. So please contact me directly. Um, and we will put you in touch with um, the relevant forms, the relevant material, and any um, – we've got FAQ documents, we've got videos. We will equip you with as much information as you can in order to get comfortable to make the investment. Um, we would then require um, an investment form, um, FICA documentation, and your – a transfer of funds. And timing of these things is crucial, Ernest, as well. One doesn't want to be going, you know what, it's the 28th of February. Boy, I better do something about this tax liability that I've got. Let me download some forms and I'll fax them off or put them in the post for Mark Barnes to deliver at some point um, to ensure that I, I get my my, uh, my tax my tax break on this. Yes, well, I think I think their cutoff point is around about the 25th, I think, because they have still have to process it. But yes, you, you can't wait that long but uh, but but typically the main thrust the main the marketing period is uh, the, those first few weeks in February. That's where, where the big rush is. And I think also in August, I think there's also a bit of a push in August when the first provisional tax payment is made. Um, but yes, don't wait till the last minute. You can wait till the second last minute, but not the last minute. Are there limits on deductions? Um, we, we talk about the, getting the tax break the full 45%, but are there limits? No, there's no limit. It's not like the donations to charities. There's no limit. So, so there's no legislative limit, as Ernest correctly said. Said, but we've picked up on two practical limits, one being uh, the taxpayer's taxable income. Because you're deducting against taxable income, we we don't kind of advise over-investing, i.e. investing more than your taxable income. And the other practical limit is with a compliance requirement within the 12J in that no shareholder can be more than 20% of the fund or share class. So there you need to look, if you are looking for a sizable investment for an asset manager that can take in sizable amounts of capital in order to ensure you comply with the 20% rule. And what happens in the unlikely but eventual certainty of death um, in the case of of 12J? Ernest, this looks like a question for the lawyer. Lawyers like to talk about death. (laughs) No. (laughs) (laughs) Fees stop (laughs) with (laughs) us. Um, okay, um, 
when a person dies, um, th- that person is deemed to sell all of his or her assets at market value, um, which triggers a recoupment. So if the shares have been held for more than five years, that will trigger a capital gain. If the shares have been held for less than five years, there's a clawback of the tax deduction. Um, so that t- in- tax is payable at the rate of 45%. That's an, one, that, that is important. If you're feeling a little bit peaky and have a tax liability, yeah. 12J then is not for you. Unless you bequeath it to your surviving spouse. Or if it's held be, in a trust structure, perhaps no, not. No, no. Even if you bequeath it to your children or whatever. And so unless you bequeath it to your surviving spouse um, or possibly a charity, but unless you bequeath it to your surviving spouse, then there's rollover relief. Then the spouse steps into the deceased's shoes. And can uh, then do uh, see out the duration, duration of the investment yeah, yeah. in that particular case. Um, immigration, lots of people then, with lots of money then are there's a full, in immigration. a full recovery and recoupment and tax, yeah. And then, Kate, let's wrap up with you. You've been in the job for three weeks. Let's see whether or not you've got the website memorised. Sure, Bruce. It's westbrook.co.za forward slash S12J. There we go. That is a wrap on the Section 12J webinar brought to you by Westbrook Alternative Asset Management. It's a goodbye from Kate Langlois. Nodding is not good, Kate. Oh, goodbye. There we go. <laughs> and and also from uh, John T. Osher. Cheers, guys. And also then from the head of the tax practice at Worksman's Attorneys, Ernest Mazansky. Cheerio. And Dino Zucullo as well. Thank you, Bruce. Have, hopefully, you've learned a lot about Section 12J. There have been some changes. There have been some alterations. But Kate is at your disposal. westbrook.co.za forward slash S12J.